So the key thing to understand here is that when you ingest alcohol, you are, yes, ingesting a poison and that poison is converted into an even worse poison in your body and some percentage of that worse poison. So some basic chemistry and biology of alcohol. And again, I'll make this very clear, even if you don't have a chemistry and biology background, because of the structure of alcohol, it is what's called both water soluble and fat soluble. Translated into what's meaningful for you, what that means is when you drink alcohol, it can pass into all the cells and tissues of your body. It has no trouble just passing right into those cells. So unlike a lot of substances and drugs that actually attach to the surface of cells, to receptors as they're called, little parking spots, and then trigger a bunch of downstreams, like domino cascades of effects, alcohol actually has its own direct effects on cells because it can really just pass into those cells. So it's water and fat, fat soluble. And the fact that it can pass into so many organs and cells so easily is really what explains its damaging effects. I should mention that there are three main types of alcohol. There's isopropyl, methyl, and ethyl alcohol. And only the last one, ethyl alcohol or ethanol is fit for human consumption. However, it is still toxic, okay? It produces substantial stress and damage to cells. I'd love to be able to tell you otherwise, but that's just a fact. Ethanol produces substantial damage to cells. And it does that because when you ingest ethanol, it has to be converted into something else because it is toxic to the body. And there's a molecule inside of all of us called NAD. And you may have heard of NAD because it's quite popular. There's a lot of discussion about NAD in the longevity literature right now. NAD is present in all our cells from birth until death. The levels of NAD tend to go down across the lifespan. There are ideas that increasing levels of NAD may extend lifespan. A lot of that is still controversial, or at least we should say is ongoing in terms of the research. But nonetheless, when you ingest ethanol, NAD and related biochemical pathways are involved in converting that ethanol into something called acetylaldehyde. It's broken down into acetylaldehyde. And if you thought ethanol was bad, acetylaldehyde is particularly bad. Acetylaldehyde is poison. It will kill cells. It damages and kills cells and it is indiscriminate as to which cells it damages and kills. Now, that's a problem, obviously, and the body deals with that problem by using another component of the NAD biochemical pathway to convert acetylaldehyde into something called acetate. Acetate is actually something that your body can use as fuel. And that process of going from ethanol to acetylaldehyde to acetate does involve the production of a toxic molecule, right? Again, acetylaldehyde is really toxic. And NAD, and it, if we wanna get technical, it's the NAD to NADH ratio. And that chemical step is the rate limiting step to ethanol's metabolism. What does that mean for you? <laughs> what that means is that if your body can't do this conversion of ethanol to acetylaldehyde to acetate, fast enough, well, acetylaldehyde will build up in your body and cause more damage. So it's important that your body be able to do this conversion very quickly. And the place where it does that is within the liver. And cells within the liver are very good at this conversion process, but they are cells and they are exposed to the acetylaldehyde in the conversion process. And so cells within the liver really take a beating in the alcohol metabolism events. So the key thing to understand here is that when you ingest alcohol, you are, yes, ingesting a poison and that poison is converted into an even worse poison in your body. And some percentage of that worse poison is converted into a form of calories that you can use to generate energy, generate ATP. And the reason why alcohol is considered empty calories is because that entire process is very metabolically costly, but there's no real nutritive value of the calories that it creates. You can use it for immediate energy, but it can't be stored in any kind of meaningful or beneficial way. It doesn't provide any vitamins. It doesn't provide any amino acids. It doesn't provide any fatty acids. It's truly empty calories. I know some people talk about sugar as empty calories, but sugar actually is a far better fuel source than alcohol or acetate. But nonetheless, when you ingest alcohol, some percentage is being shuttled into a worse poison and some is being shuttled into a fuel source. Now, the important thing to understand is that it is the poison, the acetylaldehyde itself, that leads to the effect of being inebriated or drunk. I think most people don't realize that, that being drunk is actually a poison-induced disruption in the way that your neural circuits work. And so we should ask ourselves, like, which 
neural circuits, what brain areas, what body areas involved in feeling drunk or inebriated. Now in thinking about this state of being tipsy or happy or really drunk or a little bit drunk, I wanna mention something I think most people aren't aware of. And that's the fact that for people that are regular drinkers or that have a genetic predisposition to alcoholism, when they drink, they tend to feel very energized and very good for longer periods of time. Again, people who have a genetic predisposition to alcohol or people who are chronic drinkers, or even just, if you recall, chronic doesn't have to mean a ton of alcohol, but they're drinking one or two per night or they're every other night type drinkers or Thursday through Sunday drinkers. Those people typically experience an increase in alertness and mood when they drink. Well, alcohol is indiscriminate in terms of which brain areas it goes to. Again, it doesn't bind to particular receptors, but it does seem to have a propensity or an affinity for particular brain areas that are involved in certain kinds of thinking and behavior. So one of the first things that happens is that there's a slight, at least after the first drink or second drink, there's a slight suppression in the activity of neurons in the prefrontal cortex. This is an area of your neocortex that's involved in thinking and planning and perhaps above all in suppression of impulsive behavior. 